Welcome back to the Industry 4.0 and Sustainable Supply Chain stage. I hope you enjoyed this morning as much as I did. I am Katz Keeley. I'm CEO of Beep and founder of Frontline Live, and I'm going to be your MC for the next couple of days. So the next panel is called Graphene and 140, the dream ticket to boost Man Ma Manchester manufacturing. It's um, a massive pleasure to hand you over to James Talentier, who is the communications manager from the University of Manchester. His panel will be talking about Materials 4.0 and how Manchester will set an example to the rest of the country about how the new normal can be better and faster. Over to James Talentier. Hi, well, thank you, Kat. That's Brilliant introduction there and welcome everyone to our session today. Uh, I think we've got some three excellent speakers today uh, and I'll just quickly remind you guys who they are. So we have Jürgen Meyer, well actually sorry I'll start with Lisa actually, Lisa Dale Clough, Head of Industry Strategy at the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Uh, now Greater Manchester is one of the few city regions to have its own local industry strategy and it's Lisa's role to implement that. Uh, then we have uh, Jürgen, Jürgen Meyer, Chair of the board for the Digital Catacult, uh, UK's leading agency for early adoption of advanced uh, digital technologies. Importantly for us in Manchester, is the champion of the Made Smarter initiative, which is bringing that uh, that program uh, to bring digital technologies to the northwest. And then my third panelist is James Baker, uh, Chief Executive of Graphene at Manchester, and leading the commercialisation of uh, the first the world's first. Uh, 2D man-made material, graphene. Uh, and before that role, James spent, uh, was leading innovation in the defense industry. So uh, so I'll just, our format today is fairly straightforward. It's a panel discussion. I'll be asking a few questions to each of the panelists to keep the conversation rolling. Uh, in a minute or so, I'll ask each of the panelists to give them, tell them to introduce themselves to you. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, just remind ourselves uh, why we're here today. Uh, and just go through uh, the fact that, uh, yes, as, as, as Kat said, our session is about Entry 4.0, it's about graphene, and it's about how that works together to make something very different in Manchester. But not just was in Manchester, we think for the UK as a whole, it's a model that others can, can emulate. Uh, and I guess not many people probably know this, but Greater Manchester uh, still has a big manufacturing base. Uh, it's still due to the birth of the original just revolution. So we still have a big textiles presence here, uh, components, uh, such, uh, making such as electronics. Uh, we also have uh, uh, tool making uh, and also a big sector around uh, component making for bigger supply chains, probably serving the auto or the uh, uh, aerospace industries, etc. So how do we go about supporting, boosting that, uh, that manufacturing base, particularly in the context of a post-COVID environment? Well, it looks like to us that Manchester is uh, approaching this with quite a different viewpoint. It's uh, bringing this kind of notion, its own version of, you might say, materials 4.0. How does it do this? Well, uh, taking advantage of advanced materials about 16 years ago in the University of Manchester, graphene was first isolated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's the world's first two dimensional man made material. From that uh, innovation comes some amazing capabilities. And already we're looking at that discovery as perhaps providing one of the major growth engines for the city region. Added to that is digital technology. I hope to go digital, really taking advantage of the Made Smart initiative I mentioned a few minutes ago, looking at digital tools such as the Internet of Materials. And maybe one final thing to, uh, to touch on today is directing demand and how we're pointing the region's manufacturers to the grand challenges, such uh, sustainability, uh, green growth, et cetera, and how by adopting I4O and graphene, we want them to become market leaders, not followers. So if I may, uh, can we start with Lisa uh, and, and introduce yourself and uh, say who you are and why you're here? Thanks, James. Uh, so my name is Lisa Dale Clough. Um, I'm head of industrial strategy in the economy team of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Uh, just as a way of context, um, Greater Manchester is a region of 2.8 million people in the northwest of England. 
Uh, those people live in 10 different local authority areas. Uh, and for reference, our economy is larger than the economy of Wales. It's larger than the economy of Croatia, for example, just to put things in context. We've got 124,000 businesses in the city region and 1.3 million working adults. So our economic plan was set out in the Greater Manchester Local Industrial Strategy that we launched last year. Um, and my role, as James said, is to coordinate the implementation of, of that strategy across a number of different areas. Uh, the strategy is a, a two-pronged plan, really. Uh, the, it, one part of the strategy is focused on how do we capitalise on Greater Manchester's global strengths, which include advanced materials and advanced manufacturing. They also include health innovation and the life sciences ecosystem in the city region as well. And then our fast growing industries around digital, creative and media and our aspirations around carbon neutrality. The, the plan also um, contains a number of actions to actually improve the foundations of the economy in the city region as well. So that is around improving the transport and physical and digital infrastructure of the city region. It's around knitting together our innovation ecosystem more thoroughly. And I think that's what a lot of uh, what we'll be talking about this afternoon actually comes within. It's also about improving our business environment. Um, and we've had a massive growth in startups in the city region over the last 10 years, which is also one of our strengths. And then it's also about improving the places within the city region. So making sure our towns and high streets are, are thriving and productive and that our housing and, and built environment is also as best as it can be. Um, so that, that's my role within the city region. And uh, I'm here today to, to talk about how the local industrial strategy works. Fantastic. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Jürgen, could, uh, can we just you to the audience, please? Sure. And uh, thank you very much, James, and an absolute pleasure to uh, to be here. Um, and uh, well, you've already introduced a little bit of, uh, of, of what my role is today. So I chair the Digital Catapult. Uh, the Digital Catapult is part of the whole network of, uh, of British catapults. And our role is to uh, do two things, and that is one, to help uh, industrial um, and creative companies to faster adopt digital technologies like augmented reality and uh, virtual reality, um, and, uh, uh, and also uh, um, advanced networking technologies like 5G technology, for example. Um, and the Digital Catapult also works with a lot of startup companies um, and has a role of nurturing those and helping those startup companies better engage with, uh, with industry. So that's the role I take there. Um, I'm also very much involved with the Greater Manchester team. Um, and, uh, and indeed, I was party to help and create the Greater Manchester Industrial Strategy. Um, and, uh, and the real reason why I'm here today and I'm joining this panel is because I have had a passion for many years, which goes back to my long time as working for Siemens uh, in the UK. Um, I was chief executive of the company Siemens in the UK up until uh, last year. Um, and I've always felt that we've underplayed the strength and the capability we have for technology and manufacturing, especially uh, in Greater Manchester and the uh, in the northwest uh, of England, but actually it holds true for many uh, British uh, regions. Um, and I think um, that we need to work much, much harder at creating a, a really vibrant, strong, uh, new industrial revolution. And many of people call this, of course, the fourth industrial revolution um, based on digital technologies, like I was explaining before from the digital catapult. Um, and in Manchester, there is this very unique opportunity, which is to create that fourth industrial revolution using digital technologies and at the same time 
making that based on advanced materials. So really knitting together the new advanced materials, graphene that we will be talking about during uh, this session, and the fourth industrial revolution and turning that into an amazing industrial revolution, creating manufacturing based on the new uh, advanced materials. And with it, why do we want to do it all? Well, we want to create prosperity. We want to create lots of exciting new manufacturing uh, companies. We want to create lots of new jobs and we want to export more of that technology from Manchester around the world. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. And then to James Baker, if I could introduce yourself to the audience. So thanks, James, and everybody. And again, welcome and pleasure to be on this uh, panel this afternoon. So I'm James Baker from the University of Manchester, and I'm the CEO of what we call Graphene at Manchester. So as James said earlier, Graphene, 2004, two scientists in the University of Manchester took some sticky tape and some graphite and you can all do this at home, back in the kitchen on, on lockdown. So try this out. Take some graphite and some sticky tape and peel that over many, many times. And actually the optimum is about 17 times. And eventually you can isolate a single atomic layer of carbon. So what is graphene? It's a single atomic layer of carbon. It's got length, it's got breadth. But at one atomic layer thick, it's the thinnest possible material. So what? The two scientists who discovered that in 2004 went on to achieve the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010. But more importantly, around that time, industry started to wonder, how could they use these properties of this 2D material? And you may have heard of some of them, like 200 times stronger than steel, firmly conductive, can act as a perfect membrane to allow some molecules to pass through, but to block others. How could they use that wonder material in their products and applications to create benefit to create competitive advantage. So what we're going to talk around today is the UK traditionally has had a great reputation for discovery and invention, if you like, discovered in Britain, but it hasn't always had that great reputation for translating that discovered in Britain into made in Britain. And we're going to talk a little bit today is around the Manchester model that brings together the ecosystem, the academics, the supply chain, the large corporations, the small SMEs, the startups, how do we do that in a new and unique way that actually creates value in terms of the creation of products and applications? Fantastic. Thanks, James. Well, thanks, everybody, actually. Um, so maybe just a few questions just to get the uh, conversation going. And um, I might start with Lisa, if I may. Um, so, Lisa, if you were to read the local industry strategy from, from Greater Manchester, I mean, one thing that is... <laughs> quite salient is that phrase that Jane James is referring to and, and Jürgen of advanced materials, graphene. Now if I'm a relatively small business, even a big business, I might be looking at it and thinking, why, why are you so fascinated with all this? What, what, is this really for me? And why do you put that so, so embedded in your document? Okay. So, well, graphene is, uh, well, it's obviously, it's Nobel Prize winning. It's a revolutionary discovery that's happened here in the city region. Um, it's changed materials science, uh, but it's also one of the most disruptive technologies that has been discovered recently. Um, it's opening up new markets. It's replacing existing technologies. It's changing manufacturing and production processes across multiple industries and sectors. And I think as you've already mentioned, James, not many people probably think that Greater Manchester still has such a diverse and productive manufacturing base that uh, interacts with global value chains from aerospace and, and automotive, chemicals, food and drink, paper manufacturing and production. Um, and these are the industries where the applications of, of graphene really, really have resonance. Um, we can see that's, that's already starting to take shape. So Greater Manchester is uh, designated as a high potential opportunity area for light weighting, for example, uh, which is uh, involving lots of our businesses in the manufacturing businesses in the northeast of the city region. And that's gaining international attention. Uh, and the opportunities for uh, adapting graphene are, are pretty limit limitless, really. Okay, that's fantastic. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Maybe a question for Jürgen. Jürgen, so, so if you attend meetings with, with makers, manufacturers, businesses in, in um, well, not even Manchester anyway, really, uh, 
sometimes you hear, you hear the phrase industry 4.0 and you can see that kind of, mm, yeah, maybe. I don't know if you sometimes come across that kind of attitude, but is, is industrialization really the next big thing for, 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 for British or even Manchester uh, industry? Uh, you're such a great advocate, so passionate about it, but how do you convince some, some people that, that this is the big thing? Well, um, what you say is is absolutely right. Um, that I speak to numerous manufacturers, and uh, and over the last decade, you know, there has been a little bit of oh, you know, we're not quite sure we're ready uh, for um, some of the most advanced technologies, such as using advanced data analytics platforms or creating digital twins uh, of people of, uh, of manufacturers' production processes. And manufacturers have been saying, you know, just let me sort of catch up on. Uh, on industry 3.0 first, <clears throat> but but I've seen a big change in the last, especially a couple of years, because manufacturers are realizing that this is a global race to be competitive, um, and and the fourth industrial revolution and the technologies available are so powerful at being able to improve your productivities, at being able to get your product uh, to market faster, um, that companies just can't ignore it anymore. And actually, there's been another very interesting uh, fact that has happened during this horrible, horrible COVID crisis. Um, but out of all horrible crises, there does come some learning um, and some, some lessons. And one of the lessons that has come out of this is that those factories that were better prepared with digital technologies, in other words, those that could model their factories remotely, that could make changes to their factories remotely, that could design a product remotely and get it into a production facility remotely. Those companies were better able to manage through the COVID crisis so far. So, so you know, I, I'm hopeful that there is an opportunity for that learning of the COVID crisis together with people realizing that we need to be more globally competitive, for all of that to come together and uh, and really help us accelerate this fourth industrial revolution from from now on forwards fantastic uh, so in a way you're going to use suggesting that covid is like you call this the covid catalyst this is a driver for change this is the carrot and the stick combined it's made people rethink what they're doing yeah it's shone a light you know it's really shone a light um on on companies that have not invested well enough in this uh, revolution, and uh, you know, and and actually, you know, we we're going to talk a little bit about Made Smarter. Made Smarter being a program that helps companies adopt digital technologies, and Made Smarter is getting more calls for help from companies that want to work more remotely, um, that want to be able to plant their production facilities. Uh, more remotely. And there's another um, thing that's really worth mentioning, which is um, um, very important for advanced materials. Um, if you go back to previous industrial revolutions, which have all been born on the back of new materials, I mean, obviously, you go right back to Manchester and you go to cotton, um, but the same is true for steel, the same was true for silicon. Um, something that takes a really long time is to get those materials um, really working properly within the manufacturing process and within the product that you want to get out. It took ages to get silicon from the point it was discovered through to it being in the first um, semiconductors. And the beauty of today's digital revolution is, is you don't have to try all of that physically. You can do a lot of those tests virtually within software systems. And therefore you can go through the cycle of design, build, test without physically building because you're doing it virtually so much faster. So therefore we've got an opportunity with graphene to use those sorts of digital tools to be able to get graphene products to market much quicker than we did say silicon in the last industrial revolution. Well, okay, thanks. Uh, well, at that point then, I'll take this to James Baker then. Um, so, I mean, your role really is to commercialise graphene and to do some of that work that Jürgen is talking about. You, you mentioned something called the Manchester model and uh, you talk about graphene at Manchester. Could, could you just expand a little bit on that? What, what is that proposition? Sure. So, so absolutely perfect leading from Jürgen's point. Um, anybody who's studied history of, of new materials, it can take 
many tens of years from first invention through to those products being in the marketplace in the form of a product or an application. Silicon's a great example. My background's from aerospace. And again, people may know the you know, first discovery invention of carbon fiber was here in the UK, but the first products of carbon fiber were probably 25 to 30 years before carbon fiber found its way into, into the supply chain, into products and applications. And even then, it was probably niche products like Formula One, some aerospace products. And although most people who fly or when you fly again um, in the near future, hopefully, you'll be flying on a carbon fiber plane. It's now nearly 60 years since that first discovery uh, of carbon fiber through to where we are today of carbon fiber finding its way into the aerospace sector, but still only just finding its way into the, into the automotive or into the energy sector in the, ter in the form of, 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 of um, turbine blades. So what is the Manchester model? For me, very simply, it's, it's building what Jürgen just said, is how do we challenge, if you like, the whole innovation model of new materials, but find a way of bringing it into manufacturing much quicker than traditionally it's taken us. So in the case of graphene, it's actually only 16 years since that first discovery in 2004 through to today. So 16 years, it's still very young in the, in the time scale. But if we can find a way of accelerating that new material, it will really drive productivity, new, new products, new applications in the marketplace. So the Manchester model is very much built on the science. So core to what we do at the University of Manchester is research and teaching. And today, it's not just graphene that's been looked at, but a whole family of, of other two-dimensional materials. So to date, there are over 100 other 2D materials. And the scientists are now building heterostructures or stacks, a bit like Lego bricks of multifunctional materials. So we really are starting to design the future in terms of advanced materials and putting discrimination and functionality into the products that we manufacture. If we can do that, we can really drive productivity and be at the forefront of innovation in terms of new products and applications. But not only do we have the science in Manchester, we also have the National Graphene Institute a 61 million pound facility that brings together the scientists from physics, from material science, from engineering, to do that multidisciplinary research, but to do that in a much more aggressive or coordinated way to reduce the time it takes to come from first discovery into producing a lab-based demonstrator or a prototype. We also have the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center, the GEEK as it's called. And the Geek is a very new model that's built on the catapults in the UK, but also Fraunhofer's in Germany, but also taking tips from DARPA and the US DOD and the Skunk Works that were famous around this rapid prototyping and development. So the Geek is built on this rapid design, make and validate cycle. And if we can do that in conjunction with modeling, instead of taking months and years to go from an innovation cycle of a new material into a composite or into a rubber or into a battery. And we can do that in a much more rapid make or break type philosophy. So again, from my background in defense, very much driven around a philosophy of rapid prototype, have something that works. If it works, repeat it, spiral development. Or if it's gonna fail, fail fast, learn and move on. Why does it take us years or tens of years for an innovation cycle? If we can really challenge that time and do it in a much more concurrent way, maybe in conjunction with digital manufacturing, we can reduce the lead time of a new material from the lab through scale up into manufacturing. So the ecosystem is about working with the academics, but it's working with end users. It's working with large primes. It's also about leveraging the huge capability we have, not just here in Greater Manchester, but across the UK, in small and medium enterprises, the SMEs. And it's also about creating startups. So spin outs from university, but not just a startup, but going from a startup to a scale up. So the university is looking at this model, not on its own, but in partnership and collaboration with industry. It's looking to also attract investment and funders. And if we can do that well, we can really accelerate these new products into the marketplace to improve productivity 
and to improve value. Wow. Okay, so that sounds well. It sounds like it's the right thing at the right time in a way, which is quite incredible to, uh, to hear this. Um, I, if I may, I, I might to take a point with Lisa, um, and I'm going to look at this in a kind of. So let, there's James in, in, in developing this ecosystem. But you have a kind of a, a role as a regional leader, if I may say. How do you, how do you get? I mean, you all three of you here are passionate about what you what you believe in. You certainly believe in everything you're saying and how, how does this translate it to those bigger audiences those, to civic communities where you're going to Oldham perhaps or other parts outside Manchester itself it's about greater Manchester that's quite a that's quite a region how do you go about that Lisa to, to, to tell all that story what is anything you do that you advise on um I guess as as greater Manchester we've got a, a long history uh of being an innovative place so we can tell we can point to lots of concrete examples um from the past so for example baby the first electronic programmable computer was discovered here the first railway here so we can we can talk about that sort of history and heritage of innovation but we also have a very uh, strong history of collaboration here so uh, one of the phrases that Greater Manchester always uses about itself is we do things differently. Um, and what that really means is we do things in partnership, uh, collaboratively and openly together. And I think that is one of the key, uh, the key ways in which you can take something that's quite complex, like an innovation ecosystem, and explain it to lots of different audiences. So it's how the public sector works with the private sector in the city region. It's how we take those problems that are affecting people and businesses in Greater Manchester and are translating those into innovation challenges and using them to direct where our policy and programmes and investment goes. Brilliant, thank you Lisa. Um, and Jürgen, if I may, uh, moving from Lisa's points there, as, from a regional point of view, this Manchester does things differently and it seems that we are. Now you have a role as a national leader. Uh, you sit on, I think, the industry strategy committee as well, as well as the digital catapults. You, you know, your voice of, of uh, that speaks across the nation. Do you feel that what we're doing in Manchester, what's happening in Manchester, can translate to other parts of the UK? Can we start leveling up at what's happening in the, our UK economy for what we're learning here in Manchester? Well, absolutely. Um, but I mean, the thing that we need to learn from one another, especially, I would say, in in regions outside of the southeast so that's northern regions but it's also in the southwest and the the thing we should be learning from one another is is the is the process um, by which we're creating these this reindustrialization um, the model for catapults a lot of what james was just talking about so i think we can learn a lot from one another and and i think we we are doing um, the, the issue is then is I think every region then does have to find its strength. Um, and in Greater Manchester, um, we found a particular strength in, uh, in advanced materials uh, and graphene particularly. Um, there's also a strength that Lisa said at the beginning is in health innovation. Um, and, and you do have to be distinctive in, uh, in that way. And I think that is the distinctiveness uh, of Greater Manchester. If you go over to the Humber, for example, uh, the distinctiveness there is very much about renewable energy. And uh, in my previous job at Siemens, we were very much part of creating the offshore wind industrial revolution over there. So, so I think in terms of approach, we need to learn a lot from one another and then find your distinctiveness in terms of especially the innovation and the technology area that you want to focus on. And, and this idea, you talk about the Humber, you talk about Manchester, it could be elsewhere. Uh, do you feel post-COVID that uh, supply chains, uh, that this, we, we, we very much were part of a globalisation before we came into this COVID scenario. I think, I feel things are changing now. Will that change? How will that change? Will there be a difference in how we operate? Um, yes, is, is the answer. I mean, actually, there's two factors which are, which are happening. Um, and uh, and one is 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 COVID, which is focusing the mind on uh, um, needing more resilient supply chains. Um, 
it's going to be focused on a few key areas. For example, you know, there's the classic that we've learned about PPE. Um, there's, uh, there's obviously uh, going to be a focus on having more of your capability um, to, uh, to create vaccines and, uh, and testing facilities for viruses. Um, so, so there will be that localization uh, agenda. And by the way, there will be um, graphene-based technologies that help in those. Uh, or, uh, uh, for, for, for example, um, however, um, you know, I wouldn't bet my industrial future um, on on everything becoming local because you know the world will get back to normal, um, and and we will rely on uh, global supply chains, and there will be different parts that will be specialist and highly innovative at the, what they do. And so my view is, is you cannot never beat um, innovating and being the best at what you do. And if you do that, um, then you will export, you will export globally. And, and that's really what our focus is in Manchester. You know, we're not gonna rely on the world saying, oh, it's all now gonna be local and lucky you, Manchester, you get a bit more local supply chains. You know, it has to be Manchester innovating and being the best in the world, and that's the best strategy you can take. Right, so any key markets you, you, you've got your eye on there, Jürgen, or we should have our eye on? Well, I mean, it's got to be truly, it's got to be truly global. Um, and, uh, you know, and if you create some of the best technology and some of the best products, you know, I mean, certainly things tend to start by looking at your near neighbours. So, uh, you know, you work with markets uh, in, uh, in, in Europe and that's not a Brexit point. Um, but you know, very quickly. <laughs> I, I wondered how long the B word. We've got 30 minutes through and we, before we've got the B words. That's, that's not a bad go, I think. Well, maybe we just leave it at that. We'll leave uh, it at that. Yeah. It hovers. It's uh, the elephant in the room, yeah. Yeah, but but you know, but clearly we want to be you know being truly global in this. So uh, so Manchester should be setting its eyes on uh, on both exporting but also importing actually. You know because okay. you need to import uh, know how uh, and part of your supply chain will also be imported. But you need to net export and that should be to uh, to Asia to the USA uh, etc. Mm. Uh, well. Yes, maybe just I know the strap line for the conference is, is getting the next 10 years right. Hopefully it goes beyond that as well. But in your view, where do you think uh, you'd like to, I mean, you've got this model right here now and it seems to be at the right moment, but where would you like to take that forward? Is there any particular innovations you're looking at? Any, any, any applications that are very exciting that could be game changers? I mean, first of all, just build on the previous conversations. For me, this open innovation model is the way forward with collaboration, partnership, core at that. Also, be careful, in, in my language, not to be arrogant. It's not all about Manchester. We want to work with the right partners, whether they're in the UK, whether they're international. And just to give one example in new materials, standards, measurement, characterization is absolutely critical if you want to take a new product to, to market. And in that area, we're partnered with the National Physical Laboratory, NPL, around standards and measurements. Great capability down in London in the UK. But how do we work with our partners across the UK to create that combined capability? So I think it's really important. We don't just think about local. We think about the right partnerships, the right collaborations, wherever they are. You know, catapults from Jürgen's point, you know, AMRC in Sheffield around manufacturing. Again, some great examples. And you know, to give you one case study, we work with the AMRC in Sheffield together with um, uh, the Geek and the NGI on graphene but also other universities, UCLan in the Northwest, together with some SMEs to produce a, a graphene enhanced um, uh, aircraft, an unmanned aircraft that flew at the Farnborough Air Show in 2016. So just think of the aerospace industry. If we're gonna get the aerospace um, back to where it was, I think it's gonna take several years to recover, but if we can accelerate the next generation of lighter, uh, more electric, uh, aircraft, lower noise, lower pollution, longer range, less fuel, maybe even vertical takeoff. So graphene and 2D materials, advanced materials and manufacturing hold the real core to, if you like, move into that next generation of more disruptive aircraft. So if I can have a material that was lighter, but also could absorb impact, could also de-ice my wings so I can turn my aircraft around quicker without nasty pollutants, 
could actually survive a lightning strike, but also could even charge itself as it's flying. That really would start to disrupt you know, the next generation of, of the aircraft industry. The one that really excites me probably as, as much as anything in the graphing space is that around um, uh, membranes. If you could take a dirty, salty, um, uh, contaminated water, pass that through a graphene membrane to create drinking water, not only have we got something commercially that would be you know, fantastic in terms of reducing energy, reducing cost of clean water, it would also be huge in terms of transforming water supply, not just for drinking, but for agriculture, for industrial use around the world. So graphene's got this potential, um, already been shown at very simple um, centimeter, 30 centimeter square membranes. But if we can scale that up, and that's where the geek in particular is looking to take that low rate uh, production into, into sort of scalable by the meter squared of, of, of membranes. If we could do that, membranes is an area that could really start to transform, not just commercially, but the way the water, uh, the way the world uh, secures its water supply for drinking and for agriculture. And they're just two examples. I could also talk about healthcare. I could talk about next generation of supercapacitors. So your car or your bus of the future, working with Lisa and Greater Manchester, if we could make the buses in Manchester have electric engines, but also supercapacitors, so they recharge when they're stopping and starting, we can make them even more energy efficient, longer range, lower energy, even more discriminating for Manchester. So lots of area where manufacturing and materials can really make a difference to our everyday lives and towards our targets of achieving carbon neutral by 2038, it's a huge target if we're going to go and actually achieve some of those really tough targets in the future. Yeah, that, that, now that is an ambitious target, I have to be honest. And I'm, I'm going to bring in Lisa here because it's, it was your authority, really, that uh, your colleagues that began to set those targets. So James talked about those amazing new products that could be more sustainable aircraft or membranes that can uh, do amazing things in filtration and, and, uh, and stuff, and you know, all about sustainability. Now, in your strategy and in your conversations, I've heard you talk about this directing of demand and, and, and then picking up on this idea of aiming for those big targets. How, how, how Are they too ambitious? How's that going to work, do you think? That's a really good question. Um, so our, our carbon neutrality target is uh, 2038, which is uh, 12 years ahead of, of the national target. Uh, the way that we're trying to, to do to manage this ambition is by adopting uh, the mission based approach, which um, it has been advocated by the Institute of Public Purpose in, in UCL. Um, and that involves um, a number of different strategies for both uh, directing overarching innovation pathways, but also for encouraging as much bottom up and ground up innovation as you can. Um, I guess the key components of those at the moment are something called challenge groups. Um, and these are multidisciplinary groups where we've got businesses, scientists, uh, members of the public, charities and third sector organizations, all looking at many sort of components of that overarching 2038 challenge. Um, and it's, it's through that sort of structure that we're, we're trying to approach that at the moment. Um, I guess one of, one of the key things there really, and it's something that is, um, I was just reflecting on when James was talking about how do we get the next 10 years right. Um, and for me, I'm, at the moment, I'm sort of struggling uh, with the idea of that we've been working from home for so long now uh, and the lack of um, contact with colleagues, uh, you know, physical contact. And innovation needs proximity. So whether that is uh, within cities, physical spaces, whether that's connectivity of process through digitalization uh, or the ways that we share ideas. I think it's through really creating those settings and those environments where we can have those close and intense interactions with people who think differently to us or come from a different specialism to us, which is how we're going to solve these big problems. That, that does sound an exciting idea, actually. Hopefully, yes, hopefully for the university and other, other venues, we can set those sort of uh, opportunities up. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, what's your views on all this? And, and you've heard from, uh, the, from James and that, that future 
future of products and where we could be and then this idea of Lisa of, of bringing different minds and great minds together into certain places I mean how, how, how does that excite you? Well I think it's all of that and maybe I just come back to the point of the uh, of then also setting that that really significant challenge of of being carbon neutral by by 2038 um, I think challenges like that are absolutely brilliant because they they tend to uh, bring out the best in innovators um, and uh, and everything that we've been talking about in terms of uh, in terms of light weighting uh, to be able to uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Um, but then uh, there are uh, other things where um, where graphene is going to be able to help, which is in uh, in battery technology to make batteries uh, more uh, more efficient, and so therefore uh, uh, energy storage. Uh, so so you know I think that combination of 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 a great ecosystem of good collaboration locally and globally, uh, and then having this 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 incredible challenging target to bring together the best innovators and up with, uh, with with some really good uh, good technology solutions well um and on top of that Jürgen, i'm gonna ask i'm gonna ask you this now and, and pretend james is not here in in, in your view what, what's the most important in all that is it is it your mission to get industries adopt into that digital process i mean although lisa says it's fantastic to have place the we talked about earlier and, and, and the way that helps future proof some businesses in this crisis was critical or should manchester really drive forward the, the, the advanced materials agenda which, which how would you weight that in your view look as an as a slight outsider to this maybe well the answer is is got to be both hasn't it oh. <laughs> uh, now, now you're, okay, you're such a you're, so, you're destined for politics i can see no um you know, now the sort of the, you know, the immediate opportunity to improve your productivity um, and to improve the efficiency in your factory. So that sort of here and now, what can you do today? What can you do next week? What can you do within a few months? That is that is more in the sort of uh, made smarter advanced digitalization space. However, um, it, you know, my strategies or best strategies are never ones which are in the here and now. You need to do that. And at the same time, you need to have a very clear focus on the long-term future. And I think the long-term future is uh, is very much about advanced materials and then how you can use digital technologies to, to better design, create, and manufacture a technology. So it's the coming to, uh, together of all of that. Fantastic. Um, there's been some key themes, I think, throughout this. It's definitely this idea that finding your strength regionally and really focusing on that, uh, tell your own story and tell it well, but don't but not this i like this idea that you know there's a lot of conversations of localization but don't be parochial engage with the world export import that seems very important the notion that we're going to have some really think hard and bring in some fantastic new products to market uh, and looking at where those markets might be and driving business towards that that, that 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 seems really important i think i think what's really come across from all three people speakers here is that there's a real optimism a real positive feeling from all your what you're saying i mean Lisa, I mean, how do you? Feel? Is, is, am I am I inventing that? Is or is that a, is that a genuine feeling? You are quite optimistic about about Manchester or whatever happens next. Um, well, I think it was, was it Christopher Freeman who said that innovation tends to surge forwards as crises turn towards recovery, uh, and I think that's the mindset that we that we have to adopt. Really, I, I, I'm not sure there is a choice here. <laughs> okay, a burning bridge. We've just got to go forward. Now, James, I mean, uh, you, uh, you've been, worked a long time in industry as well as serving uh, 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 sort of knowledge uh, hubs like the University of Manchester. How, 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 what's your feelings? You, you, you always, you always see an optimistic person, but how do you feel about uh, the next few years? I mean, I'm also upbeat. Clearly, there are going to be industries out there that are going to struggle, um, and there'll be some casualties through that. But just to give one example, um, you know, two weeks ago, I had a LinkedIn message of a fairly small, innovative company um, who's doing quite well or was doing quite well before the crisis, but knows it's got to innovate, taking Lisa's point, to survive. So two weeks ago, we um, had the first conversation via LinkedIn. Uh, we spoke to them a week ago, um, had an email this morning. They're about to join the Geek 
and we're going to launch a product with them hopefully by Christmas of this year. So, so there are companies out there if, with the right attitude, the right um, means, realize they have to innovate to survive. So whilst there'll be some casualties, I'm actually quite upbeat that we are going to learn lessons from, from what comes out of COVID in terms of productivity, in terms of supply chain, in terms of sustainability. I joke at the moment, my car is currently doing eight weeks to the gallon because I live in North Wales, but I'm not going anywhere. So people will find innovative and creative ways of doing things in the future that are probably more environmentally sustainable as well. And again, I think graphene and 2D materials can really play into that agenda. So yes, upbeat, but there will be lots of challenges going ahead. And we just need to get going again and, and start creating value. James, on, on that absolute high note, I'm, I'm going to bring the panel to, to a close there because that's, 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 that's such, a, such a positive message there. Um, Colleagues, uh, really grateful for your thoughts there and sharing those uh, your, your views and your being candid today. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I think hopefully the audience has enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> Thank you very much, colleague. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Kat now. Thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating conversation. I'm actually here in lockdown in Sheffield and I've worked with Manchester a lot over the years. So. All of that was music to my ears, and I'm sure there's a lot, a lot to learn from what's going on there. Um, so now we're gonna be handing over to the Q&A. Enjoy, and I'll see you for the next session. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.